Good morning. It's so good to see everyone here this morning. I know there's probably some still out of electric and they've had a lot of problems, but we're glad to see everyone out this year. I have a kind of a long list there, so I'll run through it as quickly as I can and get on with our worship service. Uh, Brother Benny and Wilma, they're still having problems. Uh, there's a new meal list out there if you want to help with that. Of course, keep in mind, Benny has trouble swallowing, so he can't swallow anything. It's, it's hard, to, hard to swallow. And I also put a card out there on the board that they had sent. Thank you to everybody. Uh, Mark Eubank, he's still having a lot of problems. He really re remains really weak, and so keep him in our prayers. Viola Graves, she's still having health problems. And Brother Russ Robbins, that's Brother Dale's brother, he's still slowly recuperating, if that's was in the bulletin anyway. Uh, of course, uh, Sister Gertrude, she fell and broke a vertebrae in her back, and Sister Gertrude, or Sister Chastine fell and chipped kneecap. so let's keep those two in our prayers. I know they're both in a lot of pain, I'm sure. Uh, Herbie's scheduled to have uh, knee surgery, It'll be the 14th. Uh, Sheila, no, she's out this morning. She's out of electricity, too. She called and said she hadn't had electricity for a couple of days. Uh, Leona Birthdays, having a birthday party Saturday over at Mount Olive Church. Uh, posted on the board, and if you want to go, she asked you to sign up so they'll know kind of how many's coming, I guess, the idea of that. Uh, J.R. Wells, he had a good report this week. Going to keep thankful for that. Barbara Mullen, she's got a new great-grandbaby, so thank, congratulations on that. Teresa Shaw, she's back with us. We're so glad to see her back. It's been so long since she's been able to be out. Uh, that's all I had on, on the sickness list. Anybody else have anything about sickness, anything at all? Uh, remember the services next Sunday, 2.30, the Highlands, keep that in mind. Shut-ins are, are Cindy, uh, Bill Whitus, Gertrude, Justine. Let's keep all those in our prayers. Anything else that needs to be announced for our order, order worship? Anything at all? Order worship this morning be opening prayer. Be Brother Stephen Eubank. Prayer for the bread, Skipper Todd. Prayer for the fruit of the vine be Danny Wells. And closing prayer will be Paul Williamson. Communion will be Brother Oris Winstead. Is there anything else that needs to be announced? Anything at all? We're really glad to see everyone out this morning. Brother Keith. Let's open your songbooks to 436. I'm seeing all three verses of Redeemed. I, um, as a note, I've, I've noticed the last few times I've led this, I've, I've drug it down quite a bit. It's a 12-8 tempo, so I'm going to try to get this going a little faster today. <clears throat> Sweet is the song I'm singing today. I'm redeemed. I'm redeemed. Trouble and sorrow have vanished away. I have been redeemed. I'm redeemed by love divine. Glory, glory, Christ is mine, Christ is mine, all to him I now resign, I have been redeemed, great is my joy, now it's onward I go, I'm homeward my praises shall flow I have been redeemed I'm redeemed by love divine glory glory Christ is mine Christ is mine all to him I now resign. I have been redeemed. Precious indeed is my Savior to me. I'm redeemed. I'm redeemed. 
redeem. Happy in glory. Someday I shall be. I have been redeemed. I'm redeemed by love divine. Glory, glory, Christ is mine. Christ is mine. All to Him. I now resign. I have been redeemed. <coughs> Number 411. <coughs> oh, the depths and the riches. We'll sing all three verses and then Brother Stephen will lead us in prayer. <coughs> Oh, the depth and the riches of God's saving grace Flowing down from the cross for me There the debt for my sins by the Savior was paid In his suffering on Calvary Oh, the death of such wonderful love, flowing boundless and full and free. And the debt for my sins was all paid in his suffering on Calvary. How my heart humbly bows in his presence today. <coughs> Me. By his stripes I am freed from the bondage of sin. Through his suffering on Calvary. Oh, the day such wonderful love, flowing boundless and full and free, and the debt for my sins was all paid in his suffering on Calvary. Oh, what marvel! mercy, what infinite love, what immeasurable grace I see. By his blood I am cleansed, I am happy and free through his suffering on Calvary. Oh, the day such wonderful love, flowing boundless and full and free, and the debt for my sins was all paid in his suffering on Calvary.
mark your songbooks to number 692. That will be the song of encouragement after the lesson. <clears throat> then turn to 424. We'll sing all three verses of Paradise Valley and we'll turn the lesson over to Brother Dale. <clears throat> As I travel through life with its trouble and strife, I've a glorious hope to give cheer on the way. Soon my toil will be o'er, and I'll rest on that shore where the night has been turned into day. Up in the beautiful paradise valley by the side, the river of life up in the valley the wonderful valley will be free from all pain and all strife there we shall live in the rose tinted garden neath the shade of the evergreen tree how I long for the Paradise Valley, where the beauty of heaven I'll see. As I roam the hillside, or I list to the tide, as I pluck the sweet flowers that grow in the dale, a faint picture is there of a land bright and fair where the perennial flowers ne'er fail. Up in the beautiful paradise valley by the side of the river of life. Up in the valley, the wonderful valley will be free from all pain and all strife. There we shall live in the rose tinted garden neath the shade of the evergreen tree. How I long for the paradise valley where the beauty of heaven I'll see. Though your garden is rare, it is not to compare with the flowers that bloom in the garden above. In the midst of it grows Sharon's perfect sweet rose. Tis the wonderful flower we love. Up in the beautiful paradise valley by the side of the river of life. Up in the valley, the wonderful valley will be free from all pain and all strife. There we shall live in the rose tinted garden Neat the shade of the evergreen tree. How I long for the paradise valley where the beauty of heaven I'll see. Well, good morning to everybody. Got a good crowd this morning, and we appreciate so very, very much the presence of each and every one. It really, really is good to see you. It's been kind of an interesting few days. Uh, we've been without electricity at our house now for, this is going on the third day, I guess, and so uh, it makes uh, getting put together a little bit more complicated, but we do the best we can and manage from there. But anyway... 
we are able to, to be here today to worship God, and we're very thankful for that. It's so good to see Rose and Les back with us. They've been away on an extended trip, and they've made it back safely, and we're very, very thankful for that. That's the answer to a lot of prayers in and of itself, and so we certainly are glad to, to see them and, and have them back among us. But for the presence of each one, to the visitors that we've got, thank you for coming. It means so much to us, and we hope that we'll be able to worship God together in a way that would be very beneficial to us, that we will be able to understand some things from God's word that indeed can help us in the choices that we make each day. We've been talking about a devotion to the doctrine of Christ. And as a beginning point of that, we've been working our way through Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, understanding that whenever we start talking about the doctrine of Christ, we're not talking just about some set of church ordinances, so to speak. Through the law of the Lord, we find authority for all that we're supposed to do, and there's a whole host of things to talk about. But the doctrine of Christ also includes all of those teachings that he gave us that affect us personally, the things that we've got to do in our choice-making to help us understand how to be the kind of people that God wants us to be. And today, as we've moved through our study, we come to Matthew chapter 7, where Jesus begins to fine-tune what he's talking about here. He's been dealing with many concepts that were sometimes misconceptions of traditions of men that had somewhat distorted the law of God. He had begun this sermon by talking about how happy and blessed a person is if they had certain character traits Oftentimes, those are traits that we would discount and think that being a peacemaker is not that big of a thing or being poor in spirit or, or whatever. Those sorts of things maybe in some categories are looked at even as signs of weakness. But see, God sees truly a blessing and a benefit in his people behaving as his children should. And so here in verses 13 and 14, of Matthew chapter 7, Jesus is pointing out the fact that we've got to make a choice. We've got to decide where our allegiance truly is going to rest and where truly our love is going to be found. You know, earlier on, Jesus had said over in the sixth chapter and down to verse 24 that no man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. The tremendous tendency for people today is to want to have, shall we say, a foot in the church and a foot in the world. We want to be able to dabble in both and get the benefits of both, but have a com true commitment to neither one. And so Jesus is saying here that in order for us to reach the destination eternally that we truly want to attain. We're going to have to set a course and stay on it. And he talks here about the straight gate. He said, enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few the and there be that find it. If we look at the spelling of the word straight here, it doesn't mean straight as in a straight line. It's talking about, as is diagrammed in the map on the, on the, uh, uh, the board up there, we're beginning to look at the idea of it being a narrow stretch of water between two bodies of land, and often that channel is filled with difficulty in navigating it. There may be rock slides where rocks have, uh, are just below the surface that have caved in from each side. It can be a very dangerous passage to get through, but it's one where you have to po put some attention and some focus on what you're doing. There is a safe channel. There is a way to get through there safely, but you have to pay attention and keep a focus on what you need to do. And that's the way it works with our living the life as a Christian. It's easy for us to become so distracted and so diverted to different things 
that serving God doesn't rise to the forefront of our attention. Serving God becomes a sidebar, kind of a, a hobby, something that we do in our spare time if we don't have anything else going on. Rather, instead, if you're talking about being the navigator of a straight and narrow channel, you can't let your attention wander. You keep a focus on what you're doing. You navigate safely to get through that channel. And Jesus is making the point here that living as God wants us to live is something that's going to take some focus. It's something that requires us to think about what we're doing, to understand the importance of what we're doing, and take care in our choice making. And in this passage, he makes a contrast. He talks about this straight and narrow way, and then in contrast to that is the broad way, the easy street, shall we say. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is indeed the path that is often the, least one, the one of least resistance because as we follow the broad way, we're going with the crowd. We're doing what everybody else says is the right thing to do. We're taking everybody else's advice. We're doing whatever it takes to get along. We're doing whatever it takes to make us popular with, with the crowd. And so in that situation, we find a tremendous number of supporters. You can do this, you can be careless, you can be irresponsible, you can dabble a little bit with this and dabble a little bit with that. It's all going to be okay because we're all just going to the same place anyway. And so there isn't the kind of care and concern that Jesus is talking about here as he presents this portion of his lesson. He's simply saying you need to make the choice that heaven is where you want to spend eternity. And once you've made that choice, pay some attention to what you're doing, follow that straight and narrow way, and you will get to your destination. If we'll be faithful unto death, a crown of righteousness is promised unto us. But we've got to keep our focus on what we need to do. Because the broad way with the majority surrounding us will sweep us up in a heartbeat. They'll give all kinds of conflicting ideas. They will present all kinds of alternatives of, oh, don't worry about it, go in this way. It's kind of like the idea of the individual who's been told, why don't you take the shortcut? And you take the shortcut, you'll get there in half the time. And then that shortcut doesn't turn out to be quite so short. And if you don't really understand, often the, the shortcut has a few twists and turns in it that people just forgot to tell you about. And so all of a sudden that shortcut becomes a much longer, difficult journey that may never get you to where you actually want to go. But that's what the majority is offering. Here is a shortcut to joy and happiness. Just do what all of us are doing. We seem to be enjoying ourselves, and we're not so belabored with what the Word of God has to say because we just are doing what seems right to us. And if it's good enough for me, then it's, it's good enough for you. And so why worry and be so concerned about right choice-making and an accountability to God? Well, Jeremiah talked about people like this in Judah in the days before Jerusalem was destroyed. Here, Jeremiah pleads with the people to go back to the old paths. Let's follow the ways of God. Let's worship God the way that we were taught to. Let's do the things in worship, the sacrifices and the other acts of obedience. Let's do what God's told us to do. But that had become a burden, and the people weren't so interested. In Jeremiah chapter, chapter 6, in verses 15 and 16, he talks about the condition of what had happened with a society that was swept up in going down the broad way. He said, were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore they shall fall among them that fall, 
In the time that I visit them, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see. And as for the old paths, where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But notice their response. But they said, we will not walk therein. To some individuals, they don't see religion and serving God as being worthwhile. To them, it's no fun. It's not what they want to do for their enjoyment. And so as a result of the kinds of choices that they make, heaven is not going to be their home. Because as Jesus says here in Matthew chapter 7, they're on the broad way. They're going a way different from the way that would take them to heaven. And so the end result is not going to be as they would like. Those that are on the broad way are often blinded by this world and its riches and the joys of this life. And really and truly, there are a tremendous number of people who go through this life struggling for enjoyment and having a good time in the here and now, and they don't think about their eternity. And so they go through their lives making their own selfish choices, doing what they want to do, sliding down the broad way with no sense of remorse whatsoever. This is fun. This is what I want to do. But now as they begin to see the ending of their days, now all of a sudden they're, uh, well, now I'm, I'm not prepared. And, and in some cases, they never get prepared. In Matthew chapter 19, Jesus talked about how we can be blinded by the riches of this world, the stuff of this life, the distractions of this life, so that we bring no fruit to perfection. In Matthew chapter 19, beginning in verse 23, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Now this was shocking material to the disciples because there was a tremendous segment of the Jewish population that had been taught to believe that the wealth that you had was a sign of God's blessing that he was pleased with you. If you were a rich man, that kind of automatically meant that your ticket to heaven was punched, that you were going to be, be blessed of God. And for some, they didn't even think about a life after this one. God was just rewarding them here, and isn't life good? God is good because he's given me all of this stuff. And Jesus said that all that stuff and the riches really complicates the trip to heaven. In verse 25, when his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed and saying, well, who then can be saved? But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, with men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. That camel going through the eye of a needle just seemed like a physical impossibility. So that was Jesus actually saying that anyone that had wealth was not going to get to go to heaven? Well, Abraham was the father of the faithful. He was a wealthy man. There were many who were looked at as uh, being affluent. Individuals who had a lot of this world's goods. Joseph of Arimathea had a tomb where Jesus could be buried. On and on the illustrations could go. And so scriptures talk about how to handle that with the right attitudes. But many people don't have those right attitudes. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that thee which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. In the eyes of the world, 
the individuals who may be deemed to be the chosen ones, the good ones, the blessed ones, the ones that are ahead of the game, maybe aren't so much. They actually are last in the eyes of God, often separated completely from him because of their love of the riches of this world. And Peter acknowledges, well, you know, we've given up a lot. I'm not a fisherman anymore. I'm just following you, Lord, and doing what you tell me to do. You know, and sometimes we can take this illustration that Jesus is giving here about the temptations and the difficulties posed by riches and worldliness, and we can kind of run off with it. But it's not right for us to make the assumption that, oh, that means that if I'm poor, then that automatically makes me righteous. You know, we can kind of reverse that psychology. And those in Jesus' day were thinking that riches was a testimonial to their righteousness. And there are some folks today who say, well, I haven't gotten anything. And it's all because I've given it to the Lord and I've just sacrificed so much. And yet, really, they'll hold on to a dime till it squeals and they are as covetous as they come. But they don't see it. Because to them, that's a problem only for people with lots and lots of, of money. Oh, here in Matthew chapter 7, and going down to verse 21, we see what is the real criteria for getting to heaven. He says in Matthew 7 and verse 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Rich or poor. That is the determining factor. Are we doing the will of the Father, which is in heaven? What happens is that Satan wants to blind us to the importance of doing that. Get on the easy path, get on the broad way, and then, soul, take thy knees. Jesus talked about this over in John chapter 12, as he talked here about those who saw so much, those who saw miracles, those who heard all the teachings of Jesus, but still they tuned it out. They were blind to the things that they should be doing in their lives. Notice what Jesus says happened in John chapter 12, beginning in verse 37. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report? And to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, he hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. There's many ways in which Satan can be responsible for our being blinded, not hearing, not responding, not thinking about how this applies to me and what I need to do. Jesus had performed many miracles before audiences, but there wasn't 100% conversion. There were some folks who still walked away with their reservations and doubts thinking that that guy's got to be a fraud and a phony somehow. I just haven't figured it out yet. But he goes on to verse 42 and says, Nevertheless, you know, even though a lot of people don't listen, even though a lot of people are not willing to change, you know, it, the truth is still being taught. He says, Nevertheless, among the chief rulers, also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be cast out of the synagogue, for they love the praises of men more than the praise of God. That's where you get to the issue. Individuals who are on the broad way want approval. And even though they may see and understand, yep, Mark 16, 16 says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. I know that, I hear that, I understand that, and I've not been baptized because... And we come up with a, quote, reason or an excuse for saying, I don't need to do that. We simply allow ourselves to be blinded and to be caught up 
on the broad way and we quit trying to navigate the straight and narrow way to take us to heaven. See, the blessedness of this is that all have the opportunity to come. The straight and narrow way is not so restricted that it's impossible for someone to travel that way and impossible for someone to successfully make it to heaven. Revelation 22 and verse 17, the Lord said, Whosoever will may come. The opportunity is presented to all men. Whenever Jesus gave us the Great Commission, in Mark 16, verses 15 and 16, he told us to go preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Sometimes we think about just our own community and those who listen and respond and those who don't. But you can broaden that picture out. I think about the men that, that we support in overseas work and the, res the reports that we get back very frequently from them of individuals who are now in the kingdom of God just like us as a result of their preaching and teaching and of those individuals choosing to go down that straight and narrow way that leads to eternal life. There are folks seeking. They want salvation. And truly salvation and the opportunity of it is extended to all men. Over in Matthew chapter 11, Jesus gives this invitation inviting all men to come to him. In Matthew chapter 11 and going down to verse 28, Come unto me, Jesus said, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. How many folks do we know that are dealing with brokenness in their lives? There are so many things that are not right. They know that they're not right. They're suffering and going through all kinds of struggle and problems. A lot of inner turmoil there that needs to be straightened out. And Jesus, here in Matthew 11, gives them the answer. He said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He said, you can navigate the straight and narrow way. You can be faithful unto death to obtain that crown of righteousness. It's not beyond your grasp. It's not something that is beyond your ability. It is simply a matter of an individual deciding that that's, what I want to do. Heaven is the goal that I want more than anything else. And I'm going to pay attention to the way that I live my life to do the will of the Father which is in heaven so that reward can be mine. Over in John chapter 4, in verses 44 and 45, <coughs> excuse me, Jesus gave us this assurance he said, no man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. It's all been laid out there for us if we will let the truth take lodgment in our hearts. You know, that's how the process begins. We don't just wake up one day and say, I'm a Christian. We just don't instantaneously have an emotional response and say, oh, that makes me a Christian. It all starts with our taking in the word of God. James calls it a begettle, if you will. In James chapter 1, going down to verse 18, James says, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, Paul told the Romans. When we hear the word of God and understand what we need to do, then we follow through on those steps, and truly then we can be born again. Remember that story in John chapter 3, when Nicodemus came to Jesus by night and wanted to know about having eternal life. 
In John chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Nicodemus was honest. Who else could raise someone from the dead like he did with Lazarus? Who else could heal some of the diseases and all that manner of sickness that was brought to him? Jesus had done that without fail. He said, we know that because of those evidences, you've got to become from God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. There was a lot that Nicodemus needed to know. But Jesus here is planting seed, teaching truth. This begettle that James talks about is taking place. If you want to go to heaven, you've got to be born again. Well, as Nicodemus asked, how am I to be born again? And Jesus answers him. He said, you've got to be born of water and of the Spirit. As we would say today, you need to be baptized for the remission of your sins, and you need to live according to truth. If we will be faithful unto death, there we get that crown of righteousness. So we see here how we can get on that path. We see very clearly how we can navigate that path and how heaven one day can be ours. But the sadness, the sadness is that Jesus continues to talk about that straight and narrow way. And when you start doing a comparison of those who choose to remain in the clutches of worldliness, abiding in the way of sin, those are the ones that are headed to destruction. And he says, many there be which go in thereat. But those who are willing to navigate the straight, those who will go through that straight gate, he said, but straight is the gate, narrow is the way to life, which, or, let me try that again. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. In a comparison basis, a lot of folks are going to choose to Avoid obeying the command of God. In Noah's day, that few was very few, wasn't it? Over in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 20, here we find Peter talking about individuals being saved. And he says in verse 20, when sometimes, which sometimes were disobedient, when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, for in few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. There were eight souls who obeyed what God commanded. Noah built that ark. They worked on that project, obeyed what God said, and they were saved. Peter goes on to say, The like figure, whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. He said, It's not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. It's not like taking a bath. It's not the getting of wet, so to speak, but it's that gives you the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You did what the Lord commanded you to do. Mark 16, 16, again, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So we can be purged from our sins through the blood of Christ. We come in contact with that, spiritually speaking, when we're baptized. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? We can clean up our lives. We can be forgiven of all of our sins and transgressions. We can rise to walk in newness of life, as the Apostle Paul talked about it but 
The question is, will we be willing to do that? Many won't. And that's what Jesus is teaching us here in Matthew chapter 7. Many are going to stay on the broad way. But we continue to extend the pleas and the opportunities for individuals to make a change. You know, the angels came and visited Abraham. And by the time Abraham's conversation was done with the Lord, if ten righteous souls could have been found in Sodom, the city would have been spared. But there weren't ten righteous souls there. And by the time it was all said and done, Lot and two of his daughters were all that survived. Often individuals simply choose to stay in sin. Even Jesus himself had to deal with that. As individuals began to hear the strength of his teaching in John chapter 6, they said, I, I, I can't do that. I, I love my wealth too much. I love other things more than spiritual service. This isn't for me. And in John chapter 6, beginning in verse 66, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will you also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. So this morning, the question resonates with us. Are we all traveling the straight and narrow way? Navigating the channel to heaven, living soberly, righteously, godly in this present world, having been baptized for the remission of our sins, and striving to be faithful. If that's not the case, it's important that we make some changes. The story is told of a man who had about three kids, and he was very affluent. And when he passed away, the way his will was written up was that his youngest boy was got all he was given was just the old barn. And the other two brothers just really rubbed it in. They made a big deal about dad sure didn't think much of you. He just gave you the old barn, and that's all you got, and we've got all these other things. Aren't we wonderful? But as it worked out, eventually the boy went out to that old barn and he found an interesting envelope kind of a thing. He opened it up and it says, don't forget to look in the cellar. And whenever he opened up the cellar of that barn, he found that there were all kinds of treasures there and that truly he'd been greatly blessed, even though at first glance it didn't appear that way at all. Sometimes it's not glamorous. It doesn't appear to be the right choice to become a Christian. But the treasures that we'll receive are well worth it. Remember the story Jesus told of the, the merchant who was looking for a pearl, and he found a goodly pearl. He sold all that he had to obtain that pearl of great price. This morning, isn't it time for you to start your journey through the straight and narrow way that leads one day to heaven. The straight gate's there. The invitation is given. Everything is in readiness. We would love to help you. And if there's some way we can help you in your walk with God, won't you come as together we stand and as we sing. Tenderly Jesus is calling, calling for you.
mercies for you and for me.
his bliss, pressed, shed blood on that cross. Father, we ask that at this time that we can focus solely on Christ's death for the remission of our sins. Lord, we pray that everything done in this manner will be pleasing in your sight. Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Son's most precious name. Amen. Amen. 